to delivering blazing fast 3D live action with accelerated volumetric video. I'm Devin, the CTO of Arcturus. It's nice to meet you. Today, we're going to be talking about what volumetric video is. We're going to go over a couple of use cases, a VR game from Vertigo Games and a virtual production demo put together by Dimension London. We're going to talk about some current challenges with the codecs that are in use today and uh, finally introduce AVV, accelerated volumetric video. Volumetric video is captured with a set of sensors pointed inward to sense a scene, and the scene is reconstructed as a series of 3D surfaces with material property maps, such as albedo, specular, normal maps, etc. Sometimes volumetric video is just called a hologram, and it captures micro performances, minor surface motions like clothing folds, muscle deformation, and this kind of thing, which help it to cross the uncanny valley in motion. You can compare volumetric video to a photograph where using traditional modeling techniques is something like painting a picture. So let's look at two use cases that are currently difficult for volumetric video and what we're doing to support them. First, Paul will introduce us to Vertigo's The Seventh Guest. Hi, I'm Paul. I'm a game director at Vertigo Games and currently we're hard at work on our title, The Seventh Guest VR, a remake of the classic puzzler from the 90s. The original game had a fun and engaging story told through full motion video. But for VR, we wanted to take that to the next level and use volumetric video instead. But in order to get those impressive captures running on performance, we needed the amazing compression that the Hollow Suite can provide. Arcturus helped us enormously with getting the volumetrics to run on performance on standalone headsets, while preserving the look and quality of the original captures. Their Hollow Suite software and custom support were vital to our pipeline as we could use both Vulkan and the latest version of the Unreal Engine. Together with Arcturus, we managed to reduce the size of our original volumetric assets to a quarter, with only a minimal loss of visual quality. And we could still play multiple streams at once, creating group scenes, a first in VR. Together with Arcturus, we're certain that we can wow visitors of the Stealth Mansion once more. So The Seventh Guest is a VR title that we're trying to deliver to a bunch of platforms, including the Quest 2, which, while powerful for a standalone VR headset, is very resource limited. The setting requires up to six actors in dialogue with each other. And the frame budget for Decode was only two and a half milliseconds of frame. Our second use case is virtual production. I'll let Callum of Dimension introduced the topic. So this project today is unique in that it's the first time that we've brought together two of our key capabilities of uh, volumetric video capture, which is a flavor of virtual humans that Dimension produces, and our virtual production capabilities of filming in an LED volume. Today we're here running tests with Arcturus, our partners, film and TV production never stands still as we all know. Um, it's continually adopting new technologies and approaches and the objective is looking at how volumetric capture can be used for background and mid-ground characters. And the whole thing about these volumetric video captures is that they're three-dimensional. So as our live action camera moves around our LED volume, everything on the wall parallaxes and rotates and translates correct from the perspective of our live action of the camera. And for the first time, our humans on the wall are doing the same thing. So wherever our camera moves, if we're looking at digital humans on the LED wall, they'll stay three-dimensional. But the key thing is that because they're volumetric video capture, they look believable, they look photo real. In virtual production, the large LED screen surrounding the stage is showing two things. First, there's the area that falls in the camera's field of view. This reprojects the scene into the camera's perspective. It handles parallax and occlusions and other view-dependent effects. 
Then the rest of the screen reproduces the lighting environment on the actors that are on the stage. Current options for actors in the background all have downsides. So actors on 2D plates can be seen only at a distance because camera motion reveals them to be flat and your camera paths need to be known ahead of time to shoot them correctly. Synthetic actors tend to trigger uncanny valley experiences in the viewer when undergoing motion or are very expensive to produce. So why not use volumetric video? Well, that would be great, but existing volumetric codecs can't meet the performance needs of rendering both the background and multiple characters in real time. Of the current codecs, there's naive encodings, which have a very large bitrate and typically can't be read and rendered in real time, and in many cases have to be kept in memory during runtime instead of streamed from disk due to I.O. limits. This also limits the total length and number of clips which can be played. And current generation encodings make great use of bandwidth and disk space, but they're performance limited, owing to a compression strategy that needs to be decoded serially. They also rely on hardware video decoders, which have per-platform limits and introduce synchronization challenges. So this is AVV, Arcturus's new accelerated volumetric video format. What you're seeing can all be rendered in real time on commodity hardware. In this scene, there are 70 independent volumetric video streams. I'll let it play through again for a better look. So accelerated volumetric video allows for a very high level of detail up to 16K textures and up to millions of verts. AVV is very fast. You can have hundreds of characters on a virtual production stage or six characters running in two milliseconds per frame on a Quest 2. Detail management is provided by progressive LODs and selective decimation system. And motion vectors help support temporal anti-aliasing and motion blur. So to make all of this work, we settled in on a couple of core design themes for the Kodak. The first design theme is to move everything to the GPU. We want to minimize the total IO cost by not moving inflated data across the bus. And we want to take advantage of the massive parallelism there. The second design theme is that video texture decoding is causing too many headaches synchronization difficulties and bottlenecks to practically address. So let's replace video decoding with something tailor-made for volumetric video. Focusing in on theme one, let's walk through three ways we could decode and look at how that affects the clock time when decoding. So let's imagine a naive codec which just tries to move the buffers to the GPU and render as fast as possible. Reading from the disk, or a transfer from the network will be expensive because the data is already inflated. The time on the bus to the CPU and from the CPU to the GPU will be much longer. And while little time will be spent on the CPU or GPU decoding, the whole thing takes a long time because of how much data it is. Now, current generation codecs, they pack the data into as small of a package as they can on disk or across the network, which saves a ton on bandwidth. This is done using advanced compression techniques that include run length encoding, which needs to be decoded serially. The decoding happens on the CPU, which takes a significant amount of time, and then that inflated mesh data has to be shipped over to the GPU. And so we've saved a lot on the front end, but we're still pretty CPU and bus bound. AVV, on the other hand, stores the data in a GPU decodable format, which is a little bigger than the smallest compression we could get, but it's fully parallelizable on the GPU. The I.O. is cheap to both the CPU and the GPU because the data stays deflated, and the clock time is minimized because the GPU can decode can happen in the massively parallel vector units. 
In comparison, AVV takes about a 50th of the clock time to render as a naive encoding. It's at least five times faster than the best current encodings out there. So what's happening on the CPU during a typical frame update? Well, on the simulation thread, we're taking the clock time and figuring out which AVV streams need to be updated and at which LODs. On the render thread, we're launching the decodes from frames that were loaded the frame before, and when they're done decoding on the GPU, we're launching the draw calls to draw them to the screen. A disk read thread reads frames that are queued from the simulation thread for decoding the next frame. In an experiment, we created as many players as we could from separate files on disk. Previous generation codecs could render up to five actors before dipping below 60 frames a second, while AVV stayed up around 700 frames per second. And as we added more streams, we crossed 60 independent streams being decoded before we dropped below 60 FPS. So what exactly are we sticking into the AVV format? For meshes, like previous generation volumetric video codecs, there's a set of segments that have some fixed elements, such as the topology and the UV layout, and a set of varying elements which change per frame. Those would be, for example, vertex positions or normals. And then a volumetric stream is just a collection of those segments, one after another. And those are packed into a segment encoding format Texture stream is composed of four layers. The lowest layer isn't even a texture at all. It's a per vertex texture approximation stored across the mesh. Then the next three layers are quarter, half, and full resolution blocks that sparsely texture the rest of the data. Let's look at this a little closer. We can think of the vertex color layer as the lowest MIP of the texture data. It holds both chroma and luma information, and it is a coarse approximation. Then the quarter, half, and full resolution texture blocks store only luminance values in BC4 blocks. These blocks are stored in a sparse stream, which gets written to the UV space on the GPU. Let's look at how the final color is built from these layers. So here's Christelle, the final forms, zoomed a little too close for comfort for your benefit. So she was captured on a capture stage. And to the left, you can see her texture map in UV space. And on the right, a render of the final image. Now, here's the first layer. Um, which is just the vertex color approximation of the color map. You can see the significant lossiness and artifacts from the vertex color approximation. Then we add in the first layer, which is the quarter resolution blocks. The left-hand side of the split shows just the added luminance blocks, and the right-hand sh side shows the combined first layer of luminance blocks with the vertex color data. Adding in the second layer, you can see the image is improved on the right hand side, and it brings us a little bit closer. Finally, the full resolution components are added in to the luminance channel, and this completes the image. You can see here that the whole face has been included at full resolution. We detect the face and give it additional importance as it has such a high impact. Here's the final image in full. So now that we know what goes into an AVV file and a little bit about how it's decoded, let's talk about how it's encoded. We start with the mesh cleanup and detail management pass. So we do some importance metric finding, such as determining where the face is or preserving any parts of the mesh near uh, certain skeleton joints that might be more important for one user or another. And then we decimate based on that importance metric. 
Then the meshes, which have different topologies for each frame, are stabilized into segments of fixed topology, like we talked about before. That fixes the UV space for those segments as well. We want to transfer the normals from the highest resolution mesh onto the stabilized data. So we pass those into a normal transfer uh, step, which improves the normal um, data for these stabilized segments. And then we encode the segments into a sort of keyframe and in-between data, which later allows us to compress the data when we're writing out the file. On the texture side of things, we need to transfer the textures from the original input textures onto the new UV maps that come out of the stabilized segments. Next, we analyze each triangle to determine what vertex colors best approximate the texture in that triangle and what the error introduced by that approximation would be. That goes into the file encoder, which writes out an AVV file with the most salient data in the highest resolution luminance blocks. And there are many more steps which are optional, but that's the general gist of it. To really get as many assets as possible into the scene, we do level of detail management. This saves on IO, compute, and render time. The format is progressive, which means we can load any LOD from the same file without duplicating any data. In the lowest LOD, we use only the vertex color data. Now that we've seen all these pieces and how they fit together, let's look at how the projects turned out. Here's a screen recording of a scene from the seventh guest. The game is still in production, so this isn't final footage. You can see the performances are very clearly human and contain subtle cues like folding cloth, muscle and skin deformation, and facial expressions that give this a very real feeling, even with the ghostly effects. The virtual production front, here's a finished clip showing volumetric background actors, human foreground actors, and uh, all of those responding appropriately to parallax and depth of field. Thanks so much for spending time with me today. Uh, if you have any questions, you can reach me at my email, devinhorseman at arcturus.studio. Goodbye.